elders are to do with the church. So far, we have covered things such as a shepherd feeds the sheep. That is the job of the pastor and the elders to make sure you receive a steady Bible diet. We also looked at how the pastor and the elders protect the sheep. That there's many spiritual influences and teachings in the world today that are meant to hurt you and to harm you. But as pastors and elders, we are to come together as a fellowship and to protect one another. And we've also looked at how a pastor and elder is to care for the people, that we are to bring the living water to you, that bread of life of Jesus, so that you are strengthened and nourished in your spirit, not so that you get thirsty throughout the week for Jesus, but that you ever live in his ever-loving presence. We are finishing that sermon up today by looking at how an elder and a pastor is also to love the congregation. And to do so, we're going to be looking today at how God himself loves us. Because as we learn how God loves us, we then learn how an elder and a pastor is to love us as well. If you have your Bibles, I'd ask for you to please join me in them. And we will be turning to the Gospel of John this morning. Which Gospel are we turning to? John. The Gospel of John. And if you turn with me to chapter 10, chapter 10. Here Jesus is expounding on his shepherding ministry and what that means. And we're going to be focusing on one little aspect today, though, of course, the most important one, I would argue. John chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. Say amen when you have arrived. Amen. amen. And I will be reading from the New King James Version. The Holy Sacred Scriptures read, I am the Good Shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Please join me for a word of prayer as we invite the Lord to bless us in a sermon today. Heavenly Father, I come before you knowing that I am just a mortal. I'm a finite man. And yet I have been asked to come and to speak about the most beautiful message of all time the everlasting love of our ever-gracious God. And Father, I ask that as I preach, that my words would be imbued with the power of the Holy Spirit, that the hearts of those will be convicted today, that as they behold your love, they would say to you, Father, you are good. You are wonderful and gracious, for your love indeed is from everlasting to everlasting. But I also pray, Father, that the pastor and the elders would hear this not just as a description of God's love, but as a description of the kind of love they are to have toward the sheep. Father, may we all walk away today knowing your love in our hearts, and may we all know that we are here to love one another and to be loved by each other. This I say in your son's precious name. Amen. You know, as I think back over it, I've been in ministry for 15 years. And over those 15 years, God has given me some absolutely wonderful churches. Every church I've ever been to has always had a special place inside my heart. And I look back on my, my, my experience as a minister, and there's one church that sticks out for today, and that is the church called Ford in Ford, Virginia. Ford Seventh-day Adventist Church, it was not like your typical church, okay? It was a very odd church. This church was started by a bunch of men who were ex-bikers, ex-alcoholics, and ex-druggies who all came and found Jesus Christ and decided that they wanted to start a church to go and bless other people. 
They were a church where their slogan was, you don't have to be perfect to meet a perfect Savior. (laughs) And trust me, they lived it. When we come to church here, sometimes we will come in and we'll watch people pull in in the BMWs or the Porsches or the Teslas. But there people came in, beat up Chevy trucks and driving in on a Harley Davidson. When you, when you went after church, most of us go for a Sabbath hike. They went out to hunt for turkey. And in that church, because they are inviting men and other women who are still rough and tumble, you are just as likely to hear someone say amen as you were to hear them take the Lord's name in vain under their breath. It was a very unique church. It was full of some rough and tumble men. But those rough and tumble men were full of the love of God. And one specific experience with that church I want to share with you today. I'm in my car and I am driving to a different church. And I get a phone call from my head elder. Now when you are a district pastor like I was back then, when your head elder calls you and you're not going to their church, usually it's one of two things. You're supposed to be there and you're not. Or they think you're supposed to be there and you're not. But usually it's not a happy phone call because one of you is supposed to have a very stressful morning. Well, I answered the phone and I was told a story by my elder. Let me give you a little bit of background. Going to the church at this time, we will, cl- we will give him an anonymous name, a man named Bill. Now, Bill had been going through a very difficult time. He was a meth addict. He was met on the street by one of my biker church members, invited to come to the church on the promise that you'll get so high you'll never come back down. So that man came to get high on Jesus. (laughs) They bring him to the church and they just surround this man with love. And he says, I have never been loved like this before in my life. I never want to go anywhere else. Well, at this time, Bill's drug habit had become very severe. It pushed away all of the people he loved his mother, his father, his siblings, even his girlfriend and his children. Finally, Bill was waking up to the damages that his addiction had done. He was trying to get his life right. And the men of the church, having been druggies themselves, promised, we will walk you through this. We won't let you go. You will get clean. And Bill was clean for four whole months. To that, the church can say amen. That's a hallelujah right there. Well, Bill thinking that now that he's been cleaned for four months, his girlfriend and children would come back. And so Bill gets on the phone and and he calls. We'll call her Jill, Bill and Jill. Bill calls Jill, says, Jill, I've been clean for four months. I found Jesus. I want you and the girls to come home. And Jill said, absolutely not. You will never see your children again. So Bill was heartbroken. And Bill, in his moment of despair, turned back to the only thing that had once given him hope. He went back to meth. So I'm driving to my one church, and I get the phone call. I answer the phone thinking, I'm going the wrong place. Bob, we know what that's like, right? That's happened before, right? See, that happens once in a great while. And I answer the phone, and my head elder, whose name was Brian, said, Pastor, we got to let you know something. Bill relapsed back into meth. He's in the Dinwiddie Rehabilitation Center. So we want you to know we're canceling church today. We're all going to get on our Harleys, and we're going to drive around the Dinwiddie Rehabilitation Center. Because when he hears the thunder roll... He knows that his church is there for him. And the women had scheduled for four hours of visitation. They went back home to make meals, to make little treats. The kids went back home to make cards for Bill. And he said, Bill can't come to see Jesus today, so we're going to take Jesus to go and see Bill. And he said, don't you worry, Pastor. I know you're two hours the other way. You don't have to come. But don't you worry, none. That boy is going to be okay. Bill was in rehab for about six weeks before they left, let him out. And the moment they let him out, Brian, the head elder, uh, who had been an alcoholic, was there with the truck ready to pick Bill on up. 
He said, Bill, he goes, it's Friday. You know what tomorrow is. He goes, you're up at Sabbath. You come into church. He said, you bet I am. He said, good, I'll be there to pick you on up. Brian picks him up and brings him to church. And instead of preaching a sermon that day, all of the men got on the stage. They looked Bill in the eye and they said, Bill, we want to say welcome on home. We know you're going through a hard time. We know that your wife, um, your girlfriend has left you, taken the girls, but we want you to know that we will never leave you and we will never forsake you and neither will God. You are fully forgiven and you are fully loved. You are our family and you belong here. Bill called me on the phone later that day crying. It's odd when you, when you see a big, muscular, Harley Davidson, red-bearded man, and he's bawling his eyes out talking to you. But he was saying, you know what I love about your church the most is that they love people with the very love of God. And to that, again, I would say hallelujah, and I would say amen. You know what God, what we see here, at the church of Ford is what God desires to have seen in every church that bears his name. Every church that calls itself a Seventh-day Adventist church, that calls itself a Christian church, should bear that hallmark of the very love of God. You see, as Jesus approached the end of his ministry, he was climaxing to two important things that he must prepare for. As Jesus comes to the end of his ministry, of course, we know he's preparing to go to the cross. He's going to go to the cross. He is going to die for you. He is going to die for me. He is going to die for us so that we one day could sit here in this church as a saved people of God. But there was one other thing he had to prepare for. He had to prepare his disciples to carry on the gospel mission once he was gone. And for them to do that, they had to learn one final lesson. If they got this final lesson wrong, nothing else mattered. Everything would fall. But if they got this one lesson right, then nothing would stop the gospel mission from going forward. And so Jesus gives them, quote, unquote, a new command. You don't have to turn there, but I will give you the reference. John 13, verses 34 through 35. And Jesus says to his disciples, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, so you also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus is saying to his hand-picked leaders, those who would go and shepherd the people of God moving forward, that they are to love everyone with the very love of God. And what Jesus expects from those disciples, he also expects from us as well. And even more so, not just from everybody, though everyone should love one another this way, especially Jesus expects this from the pastor and the elders. That when you are interacting with your pastor, whether that be at Beltsville or wherever else you may be, when you are talking with them, you should experience the very love of God. And so for today's sermon, as we close this sermon series called The Good Shepherds, I want to take about 20 minutes and look at the love of God. And as we look at this shepherding love that God has for each of us, we come to understand the love that pastors and elders are to have for us as well. I ask that if you still have your Bibles, you return with me to the scripture that we read this morning, and that will be John chapter 10. John chapter 10, and these will be verses 14 through 15. Generally, the scripture reading of the day will be my preaching text, so if you are here, always keep a little 
ribbon in that section or a bookmark there, and you will always be able to easily return John 10, verses 14 through 15. Here Jesus describes the shepherding love he has for his people. Jesus here says in verse 14, I am the good what? I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. If we just sit a moment, and we let this passage do its work, I think it would leave us all speechless at what Jesus is really saying. Jesus is not only saying that a deep connection with him is possible. He is saying that it is expected. And even more than that, he is saying you can know him as intimately as he knows the Father. And as the Father knows him. And when you realize that this is the kind of connection that Jesus longs to have with each and every one of his children, it will leave you speechless. I know my own, and my own know me. That is why you're here, Alta Grace. Bob, this is why you have been created. You have been created specifically to have an eternal relationship with God. After God spoke all of this marvelous universe into being, after he spoke the beautiful birds into existence, after he clothed the fields with lilies, after he painted the sky with rainbows, he crowned creation off by creating you. You were the final gem in the crown. You were the, the cherry on top of the Sunday. You were the priceless creation that God wanted to make you are his work of wonder. Now, despite what you may hear nowadays, you are more than just a cosmic accident. You did not just come out of a slime pool by sheer random chance evolving into a very smart primate who is able to think, look, and fend for yourself. You are more than just a cluster of cells. You are more than just a mere animal. You are a cherished and a beloved child of the heavenly king. You and you alone are capable of the deepest level of intimacy with God, Jehovah, our Savior. God is love. And this God of love desires to have a personal relationship with you. I know my own, and my own know me. This close communion with the Creator is perfectly described for us in the most precious psalm of all time, Psalm 23. Now, throughout this series, we have been looking at bits and pieces of this master text. We're not going to go through the whole thing today, but we are going to look momentarily at verse 4. And here in Psalm 20, verse 4, King David, with love in his heart, he says to God, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, the staff that David's talking about here is a symbol of the kind of relationship a shepherd has with his sheep. Because you see, the staff for a shepherd was more than just for leading the sheep. The shepherd, as he would walk with his staff, would systematically walk through the flock. And he would take that hook on the staff. He would hook it around a sheep's midsection, and he pulled that sheep toward himself for the sole reason to pull the sheep to his tender embrace. The sheep did nothing wrong. The sheep needed nothing. The shepherd just wanted to give that sheep his love. In fact, there were times when a shepherd would just be sitting there and would lay their staff on top of a sheep just as a way of maintaining a connection with them. 
And then there's even records of times when the shepherd would lay the staff on the sheep and would walk hand in hand with them, so to speak, all throughout the field. The shepherd drew the sheep to them, connected with the sheep, and refused to ever leave the sheep. What a beautiful way to describe the precious love that God has for us. In the same way God draws you to him, he says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you to me with loving kindness. And just like the shepherd, God remains connected with you. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. And once you have drawn near to one another, and he has you in his embrace, just like that shepherd, he never wants to let you go. Because there's nothing and no one who will ever be able to separate you from the love of God that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. The shepherd has saved you. He has drawn you. He has brought you to him. And now that you are here, he never wants to let you go. You see, Christianity, it's more than just doctrine. Doctrine is good. We need to have the right teachings. That is true. And we Adventists have been known as people of the book, right? We know our Bible, all right? We know what we believe, and we know why we believe it. And that is a beautiful, precious, and wonderful thing. And that should never change. However, it is not enough just to know the Word of God. You also need to know the God of the Word. And so the Lord comes to us to bring us into that relationship. Philip Keller, one of my favorite authors, said, The Christian life is not just one of subscribing to certain doctrines or believing certain facts, as important as that all may be. Essential as all of this confidence in the scriptures may be, there is as well the actual reality of experiencing and knowing firsthand the feel of the Savior's touch, the sense of his spirit on my spirit. There is for the true child of God that intimate, subtle, yet magnificent experience of sensing the comforter at his side. Christianity is more than just a bunch of abstract truths. Christianity is about having that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus himself said, I no longer call you servants. For a servant does not know what the master is doing. But now I call you what? Friend. I call you my friend. And all that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You, you, no matter what you have done, no matter what you, has happened this week, last year, for the last decade, you are a forgiven child of God. You are friends of the heavenly king. That's right, Bob, I'd be pumping too. Hallelujah. Yeah, no. <laughs> amen. You can say amen. We'll let you do that, right? You, Christianity is about you loving God and being loved by God. And oh, God loves you so much. I'm like Paul. I pray that one day you would understand the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of the love of God that you have in Jesus Christ. David lovingly speaks of God's love when he says again in Psalm 23, verse 5, Lord, my cup, it overflows. That overflowing cup that we see in the psalm it's speaking of a relationship with God that never ends. You see, back in the days of the Bible, whenever you would go to someone's house, much like today, it was expected that your host would give you a refreshing drink, right? A little bit of water, maybe some ice. And it was that way they were telling you that you're welcome to stay. And as long as you're there, if they keep filling your cup, then you can stay. But if you start seeing that cup is empty and your host ain't bringing you back any more water, 
They're giving you a very nice hint. Girl, <laughs> it's time for you to go home. But when you're with your best friend and they're really enjoying your company, they would just keep filling your cup, sometimes not even knowing you're not drinking, and your cup would spill on over, would dump all over the table, and it was that way that they were telling you, I am having such a good time with you. I hope this time never ends. Look at your table by God. Is it wet? I bet you your table's absolutely drenched. Because the Lord fills your cup up to the point that it overflows. It's spilling out everywhere. And Jesus is telling you that I want to be your friend forever. I want to be with you. I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. You are mine, and you are mine alone. You are a dear, beloved child of God. God desires to have fellowship with you. Fellowship where you know God you are known by God. A fellowship where you are deeply connected, where you're not just a creation, you're not just a servant, you're not even just a child, but you are his friend. And let me tell you, there's a difference between being a child and being a friend, right? We have a few fathers here today. I'm a father myself. I love my children. To, to an extent, we're friendly, but they're not my best friend. They don't know my deepest and darkest secrets. <laughs> you know? I don't want them to. <laughs> but a friend, oh, you know your friends, and your friends know you. And that is what God is saying to each and every one of us. And the beauty of being part of church, though, is that that kind of love is not only available between God and us, is also available between us and one another. Remember the second half of what Jesus said, it was not just that you would know him the way that he knows the Father, but that you would love one another the way God loves you. And when we're honest with ourselves, isn't that what we all really want in our church? A church where we are known, where we know others, where we're loved and we can love others as well, that we can be accepted by people no matter what our faults may be, no matter what problems we may be going through, that they know them and they accept us and love us anyways. And even more than that, but they'll take us by the hand and they'll walk through that fire with us, promising that we will never be alone. Don't we all want a church where we are loved and we can love others as well. It's not an accident, my friends. That is hardwired into your being. It is baked into the very person of who you are. God created you to fellowship. We see in the Bible, it is not good for a man to be alone. Now, yes, in that passage, God brings Adam a wife, but you don't have to have a spouse to have deep friendship with somebody. Right? Jesus said, if you even leave your husband or your wife and you join the church, you will get 30, 50, 100 fold brothers and sisters to give you the love that you thought you had lost. And the church is to be that kind of place where you are loved and you love others in return. Ellen White said to us in Acts of the Apostles, page 9, the church is the repository of of the riches of the grace of Christ, and through the church will eventually be made manifest even to the principalities and power in heavenly places the final and the full display of the love of God. What displays the love of God? The church, when it's loving the way God ordained it to be. And so as we move forward as a congregation, we must embody the very love of God. And the same love that I have just described that God does for us, drawing us to him, connecting with us, and walking with us through all of life's difficulties, is the very love that we are to show one another as brothers and sisters in Jesus. 
We want people, when you come here, what I want is for you to experience the ever-flowing grace of an ever-loving God. That when you walk away and you've been here, you said, I met Jesus when I looked at those people. Wouldn't you like someone to say that about you? That you loved them so well that they thought you could have been Jesus. <laughs> they saw Jesus in you. And all of that starts with a shepherd modeling for the people what that love looks like. And so as we end this series on the good shepherds, I want to let you know what I will be doing for you all moving forth. Now I know we have some visitors here. I am predominantly speaking to the members at this point, but we want your visitors to become members as well. And so know that what I'm promising to everyone today is not just for the members, but if you come here regularly, this will happen for you as well. But in order to model this love, what we are going to begin instituting, I've already instituted this at Damascus. Now, they have a, an elder team that takes care of most of this, but I will take care of this here. And that is every single month, I'm going to begin reaching out to you by phone for a monthly shepherding call. Now, I want to be clear. This is not just the typical, hey, how are you? This is not just me calling in to say, hey, you all want to go catch a game? You want to go for a hike? This is not a hangout call. Now, all of you should know by now, I'm a pretty down-to-earth kind of guy. I'm a very down-to-earth kind of pastor, right? Got someone chuckling back there. He knows what I'm talking about, right? That's just who I am. But when I call you for your shepherding call, I'm not just calling as a social visit. It's a spiritual call. And in this call, my intention is to do for you what God also does, is to intentionally draw you to myself so that I can love you and be loved by you. And during that phone call, I'm going to take time to understand what is going on in your life. I will ask spiritual guided questions, questions such as, how is your soul doing? Doing good? If you're doing good, I will celebrate to the high heavens with you. Amen. If you're doing bad, I will walk through hell with you. I'm going to ask you how your devotional life is doing. And you can be honest, because it's a non-judgmental place. If it's going great, wonderful, tell me what has the Lord said to you recently. If it's struggling for some reason, that's okay. How can I come alongside you and help you with it, right? As we go through these conversations, that's my way of connecting with you of knowing what's going on. Because as we know what's going on, then I know what scriptures to share with you. I know what songs to sing with you. I know even maybe what we should be preaching on. Of course, I would never say what we discuss in private from a pulpit. Heaven forbid, that would never happen. But the most general topic, we can absolutely peruse together because I know that the people need it. And just like God I'm sorry, just like the shepherd who laid the staff on the sheep and never let go. And just like God would never let you go, it does not matter what you have done. It does not matter what mistakes you may have made. If you're wrestling with a sin, you're trying to overcome something, it does not matter. You can be open and honest with me because I will never leave you or forsake you. As a pastor of 15 years, I've seen it all. I really have. I also grew up in a family of drug dealers and drug addicts. I also saw it all. <laughs> I, there's nothing, nothing you can bring to me I have not already seen and walked somebody through. And I want you to know that no matter what may be going on in your life, I will always love you. I will always care for you. I will always protect you. Because that is what a shepherd's supposed to do. As I said in a previous sermon, as I close this sermon now, in a previous sermon I mentioned how the pastor over the last few years has changed. The pastor has shifted from being a shepherd to more being like a CEO, right? The pastor's office, has, the pastor's study has changed to be the pastor's office. Rather than seeing books and comfy chairs, you see computers and a bunch of documents because they're running a church. I don't see myself as running a church. 
I see myself as shepherding a flock. And that flock deserves to know that there's a pastor that wants to heal them, to care for them, and to guide them. And I hope that as you see the love that I have for you, and as you experience it, that you will also taste and see that the Lord's love is good, and that at this church you would feel welcomed, safe, and a place of belonging. This is what I offered to Bill after his relapse. I met with Bill. As I already explained to you, he was a heavyset man. He was one of those he, a typical looking construction worker, right? Pot belly, but strong up here. One little flick, he knocked me against the wall. <laughs> you know, big, long red beard, tattoos going down his arms. But I met with Bill. I said, Bill, I said, yeah, and I have permission to share this part. I said, Bill, you have to remember, you went through the process of being clean, but Jill hasn't been able to go through the process of forgiveness. She has not walked the path with you as you became clean. We need to give it time. And so, because us pastors are chosen to meddle in people's lives, <laughs> I called Jill. I said, Jill, you don't know me. But my name is Pastor Sean Kelly of the fourth Seventh-day Adventist Church. What's the Seventh-day Adventist? You, you one of the Mormons? No, 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 no. Uh, we worship on Saturday. Other than that, we're pretty much like most Christians. Let, let's not get hung up on that. We're, we're not calling about the church. Come on, Bill. Bill! <laughs> said, um, look, I'm not calling to tell you to give Bill a second chance. I'm not calling to tell you what you need to do. I don't know what you went through when you went through that hell with him with his addiction. I don't know. What I do know is I grew up in a family of drug addicts. And I had an experience, and this is true, when my first son, Michael, was about to be born, my mother uh, came to visit. Actually, he had just been born. And I explained to Jill this story that I'll tell to you. We sat on the couch. My mom's talking to me. She remembers all the times that she lit our Christmas tree on fire, the times she threw our presents out the window because she got angry, the times that she'd hurl glass us uh, so the balls back then they were glass right now they're all tin cans but back then you know yeah the neck the body could really wing those suckers if you wanted to she's remembering all of that and talking to us about that and she is weeping on my couch and she says to me she says sean i just hope that you can find it in your heart to forgive me i said mom you don't understand when i came to jesus way 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 long ago this must have been about 20 years ago I came to Jesus. So I forgave you then. Because my Lord says that he'll forgive me the way that I forgive others. And I said, it wasn't easy. I prayed. I struggled. But I forgave you a long time ago. I think it's about time that you forgive yourself. And I said to Jill, I said, you know what? My mom and my relationship has been the best ever since because I learned how to forgive a drug addict who put me through pain. And I just want you to know, Bill is not the same man he was when he was with you. I just want you to know the situation so you know how to decide appropriately. The next Sabbath, I was preaching in Ford. <laughs> and these two little girls walked on into the church. I had no idea who they were. And then Bill walked in. And Jill walked in. Here's, here's the story. Jill and the two girls sat on one side of the pew. Bill sat all the way on the other. But they were there. I began counseling with them, teaching them the love of God, heard terrible things that Bill had done, heard some terrible things that Jill had done. Okay, let you all know. Very rarely is it a one-way street. <laughs> okay. And as we hear these problems... Let's walk through forgiving that problem. And literally, over the next few months, I start watching Jill and the girls and Bill start getting closer and closer. And the last session we had together, I put the whole family down. They were finally willing to forgive, move back in with each other. And the girls were there. They weren't married yet. Okay, that came later. Another pastor ended up conducting their marriage, not me. That was a different different. A uh, shepherd that took care of that. But as they came together, I laid my hands on them and I prayed that they would forgive. 
And the girls were crying. E was crying. Joe was crying. They held each other as a family. I let go. They kept holding. So I put my hands back on. It got awkward, so I just let, I just let go. I didn't really know what to do. And I just stood there, and they cried for 10 minutes. And I just sat there in awe of this beautiful moment that happened. And then finally, the next Sabbath, there they were in the middle of the pew, holding each other like a family. And Bill and Jill got up and said the same thing to the congregation that Bill had said at this time, six months prior. He said, the reason I love your pastor and this church is because they love us with the very love of God. And that's what I offer to you. That is why I'm a pastor, is to walk with you, to love you, and to cherish you. So as we move forward from here, if you're a member of this church, you can expect to start getting a monthly phone call from me beginning in June just to make sure you're doing okay. And of course, now that COVID is over, we're going to be able to begin doing in-home visitations again. It's so one thing that was very hard on me during the pandemic was with Rockville and uh, Clarksburg and with Damascus, I wasn't able to visit people in their homes. I wasn't able to get to know people. And that's hard as a pastor. But that time's behind us now. And now for I can get to know you as deep as the Lord wants us to. And all I ask you in return is that you let me into your home, that you let me into your heart, and together let me minister to you from the word of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your precious love, a love that never fails and a love that never ends. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us through the Sabbath, that we would draw close to you, that you would draw close to us. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that we would taste your love and that we would never thirst for love again because we have finally drank from your ever-flowing grace and known your everlasting love. This we pray in your son's name. Amen.